Um, we talked yesterday uh, at the end of uh, our, our last lecture about Ezekiel building the little siege model on the clay tablet with the drawing of the city of Jerusalem and the model of the little siege engines and the siege ramp. And uh, that is a, a good opening to talk a little bit about warfare in the ancient world because warfare was coming to Jerusalem. And warfare was very much part of fabric of, of life in the ancient world. Unfortunately, uh, still is in much of the world today. The techniques have changed, the technology of war has changed, but uh, a lot of the same motivations that drive people uh, against other people are still very much alive in the human race. <clears throat> in any case, in the ancient world, infantry was largely divided into three kinds of uh, soldiers. Uh, bow shooters, uh, by this time in history, they had developed what is called the composite bow, uh, which is a crossing of the wood grain, uh, which makes a much more powerful weapon and able to be a shorter, a shorter bow than the long bow. Uh, spearmen, of course, that's a uh, javelin is, is just a long shaft with a, with a uh, spearhead on it. And then slingers. <clears throat> slingers, um, uh, most people think of David and Goliath when they think of slingshots, sort of like my little sermon on Monday night, but uh, slingers were very much a part of warfare and they were very accurate in slinging. In fact, you may remember from the book of Judges, there was a core of left-handed slingers who could uh, hit a mark, and it says not missing it by a hair. Now, that might be a hyperbole, but that does nonetheless say that these were very accurate. And, of course, with a slingshot and the centrifugal force of the length of the sling, uh, you can throw a stone much, much further than you could imagine uh, by throwing with your arm or something like that. Anybody ever made a slingshot like that with the straps and the pouch? Um, I did that once when I was a kid. I threw this rock down the street, way, way down the street, and it hit the deck on some guy's house who was standing under the deck. And it hit really hard, and he was a changed man. He, he came out, and uh, I thought he probably wished to be alone, so I retreated and... Uh, uh, <laughs> Didn't spend any more time out there. <laughs> <clears throat> Supporting infantry included chariot corps. Chariot corps in the ancient world was sort of the modern equivalent of a, of a tank. Uh, it was fast. It was mobile. Um, uh, scalers would be those who climbed walls or ladders. Uh, sappers are those who dig, dig under walls or dig to erode foundation elements and then siege machines. So we're going to look at each of those just very briefly. These are Assyrian bowmen and spearmen. You may have seen these or seen some very much like this at the British Museum when you were there a few weeks ago. Uh, you can see that the, the bowman has a quiver of arrows. He also has a short sword. The spearman has a shield as well as a short sword. Uh, bowmen are longer range. Spearmen are a bit shorter range. And slingers are long range as well. This is a slinger. Um, did you see these bar reliefs when you're in the Assyrian section? Was this part of uh, the part you got into? So there were a number of, uh, of bar reliefs of slingers like this, and you can see they have stones in the one hand, ready to uh, put in the pouch of the other after they've let go uh, the one sling. Um, <clears throat> there's also in the glass cases. I don't know if you noticed. There's a there's one glass case that has little uh, uh, stone uh, sling balls. Uh, about the size of a, a little larger than a golf ball, uh, but maybe not quite as large as a tennis ball, uh, but pretty lethal. <clears throat> Several technologies developed to protect cities from invasion, uh, and these include uh, a number of things. We're going to look at just briefly each of these things. Casemate construction, header stretcher construction of walls, inset offset wall construction, uh, special construction of gates, towers, what's called a glacis and water tunnels. So I won't spend a long time with this, but uh, just briefly, this is a casemate wall. A casemate wall is a double wall in which there are partitions that uh, strengthen the wall and then the center area is filled with slag uh, or just loose gravel or loose you know, impediments, that sort of thing, other than the fact that sometimes they were left open as storage areas and occasionally <coughs> they were large enough for someone to actually live in. Uh, there's one occasion of this in the book of Joshua 
in which uh, uh, Rahab, uh, if you look carefully at the text, the Greek, I mean the Hebrew text says quite literally she lived in the wall. Uh, she didn't live at, by the wall, she lived in the wall, which probably means she lived in a casemate uh, in the wall, something like this. Um, header stretcher construction is basically the idea of uh, if you're building a wall, looking at it kind of from the top, uh, you know, you lay stone like this, and then periodically you have stones that go like this, so the short end is out here. Um, you may have a, another long piece here, and then one like this, but this crossing of the, the long and the short gives a particularly strong wall, and you can see it in this depiction. You can see the short ends in this wall here as opposed to the longer uh, laying of the stones that direction. This is uh, uh, the walls of a town in southern Judah that have been reconstructed by archaeologists. Uh, they didn't stand for 3,000 years without being falling down, but they have been reconstructed. But you can see a couple of important features of these walls. One really important te technological uh, advancement was the development of an inset to the wall. You can see these insets. And those were really important for defending from the top of the wall. Because one of the problems with a wall structure is that when people get in close to the wall, your enemy, how are you going to see them other than leaning out and looking over, which is usually not a good idea, uh, especially if they have bows and arrows. Um, so what you want to do is you want to be able to look not over the top this way, you want to be able to look down the wall, and the offsets in the wall give you a chance to look down the wall line uh, with at least a minimum amount of uh, protection. And then, of course, you have gates, <clears throat> which are usually flanked by towers, uh, the gates of a city are usually the most vulnerable part of any city because gates almost have to be made out of wood. You can't make gates out of rock, uh, not very easily anyway. Um, and uh, when you were at the British Museum, uh, did you see the Balawat gates? Uh, so you saw those big wooden kinds of gates, which would be the, more or less the kind of gates we would, we would expect to see in between these sorts of towers. Problem, of course, with wood it burns. And so, <clears throat> uh, and, and it's also more vulnerable to a battering ram. Um, uh, so uh, you want to protect those wooden gates, and you do that with towers in which, <clears throat> excuse me, in which there are infantry on top of the towers with bow and arrows and that sort of thing. Gate construction, uh, very uh, important uh, because the gate, as I say, is the more vulnerable part. And from the time of about Solomon, uh, a number of gates are excavated in uh, ancient Israel, all very similar to each other in which the entryway to the, to the city is through this kind of a gate with these little alcoves. Now the alcoves in time of war can be filled with soldiers. And the gate is relatively narrow, so if the enemy is trying to come into the gate between sets of soldiers that are ready to defend it in these alcoves, it's a pretty withering uh, attack uh, or, or withering defense of those trying to get in. Once in a while, uh, like this one at Megiddo, you have a bent axis gate where the, the actual uh, gate comes this way and then goes this way rather than straight in, which makes it much harder for an enemy to come at it with a battering ram because it's like carrying a, it's kind of like carrying the piano around the staircase, you know. You can't get it around a corner. Uh, so uh, there, were, there were these kind of techniques. This is an actual excavation of the gated gazer, uh, which is the, the first one diagram here. And you can see the way the stones are laid there. Now in peace times, gates served as kind of a civic center. This is where the elders would meet and they would convene local city business. A uh, small claims court where two neighbors are fussing over a boundary line would meet with the city elders and they'd get it sorted out. But in, uh, in war times, uh, the gates were, were very heavily protected. Also, generally speaking, when you build a city in the ancient world, what kind, of, um, what kind of things do you need to think about to protect yourself if you're going to build a city? Well, you need water. 
I need not only water, I need ink. Um, let's try this one. Okay, you need water. Someone said wall, of course. Yeah. Food. Any uh, other ideas? Pardon? Oh, weapons. I'm sorry. I thought you said whippings. I thought, well, <laughs> maybe. <but> I... <laughs> sorry. My <clears throat> American ears don't really catch on sometimes. <laughs> Pardon me? Fuel, yeah, absolutely, yeah. People? Well, yeah, I suppose you probably need people. <laughs> um, I'll take that as a given, okay? <laughs> uh, you also want to build on an elevation. It's always better to be defending yourself by shooting down than being down trying to shoot up, okay? <clears throat> this is why the early, <clears throat> the early capitals of the northern kingdom changed three times. Now, the capital you're most familiar with in the northern kingdom of Israel is Samaria. Samaria is the third capital. And the, the other two, each of them had a problem, and one of the problems was they were kind of low in the low area. So the speculation by archaeologists is those capitals changed from Tirza to Samaria because Tirza wasn't very defensible. Actually, the enemy could stand up on the hill and bomb away down at them, and that's not a good thing, you know. So uh, in any case, you want a, some kind of an escarpment where you can build your walls this way um, and protect yourself uh, on the top of the escarpment. But of course, one of the problems with an escarpment of height is that you don't usually have rivers up here. So you got a water issue, okay? Because water usually is running down on the bottom somewhere if it's in a creek or something like that. So basically what they did was they created water tunnels, shafts, went down to some sort of a watershed or an underground pool in order to build on a elevation but at the same time have access to water. Uh, that was the, um, the primary advantage of the city of Jerusalem. Remember when, the, when David first <clears throat> was going to approach the city of Jerusalem when it was Jebus and uh, the defender says, well, you can't get in here. Uh, but David apparently found the water shaft and he came up the water shaft with his men into the city. Um, <clears throat> in any case, there's also what is called a glacis and a revetment wall. Now the glacis is this very steep uh, area here, and the revetment wall is this second wall down here, which generally is about uh, maybe four, four feet high, something like that. And that makes it very difficult to get a battering ram up close to the wall. You can get the battering ram, even if you can get a ramp up the hill, you still have got this vertical wall you've got to get over. And so this becomes a, a way of, uh, of certainly slowing down the process of siege with a siege machine. This is a water tunnel. This is at Gibeon in Israel. Uh, this is the way it looks from the top. There are steps down to the bottom of the cistern. But then when you get to the bottom, there is an underground shaft, which is this, that goes all the way down to an underground pool. And you find this kind of installation in a number of places in excavations in ancient Israel. This, uh, this uh, really important feature for making sure that you have a water supply. In fact, water is probably more important actually than even food. You can last a lot longer without food than you can last without water. So you've got to have water. So those were really important features uh, of ancient warfare. And in attacking a wall city then, uh, the enemy would try to burn or breach the gates somehow. Uh, they might scale the walls with ladders or scaling hooks uh, or try to tunnel under the walls or put the city to siege if all of the above uh, uh, doesn't work. They could build a siege ramp, which would be uh, a long process, but a process by which you would try to find what appears to be the weakest section of the wall and a, a, a siege ramp is basically a long inclined plane. And uh, then you can uh, put your siege machine with a battering ram, you can roll it up here and start banging away at the wall. Uh, on the other hand, if you have a casemate wall 
which is filled with slag, this becomes a wall that absorbs a lot of shock. Very different than just a single wall. So the casemate wall was an important innovation because it was a, a, a good defense against a siege machine. It made it more difficult for a siege machine to punch through because of, 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 the, of the construction of the wall. Here's some examples, some of these you saw when you were at the British Museum. Uh, some guys going up the ladder here uh, on top of this wall. <clears throat> By the way, what, what, what do you figure the lifespan is of a soldier, the first one up the ladder? <laughs> about, about 30 seconds? <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know how they got that first guy to volunteer to go up there. You can see the one guy, he's, 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 got, he's, he's the guy at the top, but he's coming down. Right after the, well, the first guy's coming down, the next guy's coming down too. So, um, I, I don't know how they, how they made those kind of choices. I think I would be more of the, of the, of the bow shooter kind that you stand a long ways away and just fire away. <laughs> this is a sapper who is tunneling underneath a wall. You can see he's working on the bottom of the wall and trying to dig out sections of the wall, perhaps uh, to get the wall to collapse or perhaps to actually create a tunnel by which you could tunnel under the wall and get into the city that way. <clears throat> this is uh, an, uh, an Assyrian depiction of cutting off the water supply. You can see the, the bucket, which has probably dop, dropped down to a deep shaft to a pool, and he's trying to cut off, uh, cut off the water supply by getting rid of the means to get the water. This is the, probably you spent some time looking at this one in the British Museum because this is the siege of Lachish, not too far from Jerusalem uh, during the Assyrian period. And you can see the siege machine, which is on wheels with a long battering ram. <clears throat> it's working its way up to the tower, punch, trying to punch through the top of the wall. The defenders, which are Israelites, are on top of the wall, and um, they are throwing down firebrands. These would be large uh, twists of straw dipped in pitch set on fire and try to catch the siege machine on fire. And then you have a, an Assyrian here with a big long ladle and he's pouring water over the machine to keep it wet so that it doesn't catch on fire. Um, <clears throat> so siege machines were, were very much a part of Assyrian warfare and Babylonian warfare and they would be the, the main means by which Nebuchadnezzar would breach the walls of Jerusalem in 586. Yeah, this, this thing here, yeah, it's a, it's a long pole, but there's a fulcrum. There's a, right up here, there's a thing that attaches so that it swings back and forth. And so you get it up close, and then, you, then you're just going back and forth to, to, to batter the wall and hopefully breach it, and hopefully not get killed while you're trying to do that. You know. And these are uh, refugees heading off into exile with their packs on their back. They're... They're, they're, they're already prisoners of war. Um, obviously, Lachish was destroyed by Assyrians. But as um, Isaiah says, the Assyrian is Yahweh's war club. Okay? So Yahweh, Yahweh did it, but he used the Assyrians to do it. And the Assyrians be, became essentially Yahweh's tool, if you will, to destroy the city. And, and is, that's the exact language that Isaiah uses. The Assyrian is Yahweh's war club. Um, and so he uses that war club as a judgment uh, upon the sinful nation. Yeah. yeah, in the time of Hezekiah, you're talking about the angel that destroyed the Assyrians? Uh, yeah, um, I don't know how archaeologists read the biblical story, but there is an analogy to that in Assyrian texts. Uh, no, I'm sorry, not Assyrian text, but in the, in the Greek writings of Herodotus, the Greek historian. Herodotus uh, tells us that uh, mice invaded the Assyrian camp and they all fled. Now, mice are very easily carriers of things like plague. Uh, I don't know if it's the bubonic plague, but, but something like that. And so uh, often, at least biblical scholars, tie those two things together, that <clears throat> the, the plague that fell upon the Assyrian armor may well have been a plague carried by mice. Uh, Herodotus does tell us at least this, 
this thing that, that the mice invaded the Assyrian camp and they all fled. Um, so God uses often, that could even use us, huh? <clears throat> God uses unusual means, but, but sometimes means that from one point of view looks natural, but from another point of view is directed by God. Um, any more questions about this stuff while we're at it? Yeah, because it takes a long time to build that inclined plane out of rocks and dirt and stuff, yeah. But if they got the city sealed up, I guess they figure they're, they've got time on the side. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Usually under some sort of protection, they try to, 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 to build a protective shield for the workers who are building the ramp. Um, the Roman ramp, this is a long time later, but the Roman ramp at Matsada took over two years to build to the top of Matsada for the Roman seed machine to get to the top. Um, uh, the siege of Jerusalem in the time of Nebuchadnezzar was uh, over two years long too. And probably a good deal of that was building siege ramps. Yeah, weak, uh, ready to give up, you know, demoralized, all of that sort of thing. Yeah, Beth? Uh, at Masada, I'm not sure about Jerusalem, but at Masada, the Romans, at least that's part of the record that the Romans used Jewish slaves to build the ramp. Now, I don't know whether the Babylonians did the same thing or not, but we do know that the Babylonians and the Assyrians both used mercenary soldiers. <clears throat> so it's very well that the people building the siege ramps were not, were not the prime troops. They were people who were coerced from other captured cities and had become prisoners of war and slaves uh, to do this kind of work. Yeah. The, the idea of the Romans was that if they used Jewish slaves to build the siege ramp to Matsada, the defenders wouldn't shoot them because they would be shooting their own people. Um, here, I don't know. There's no, nothing in the records that we know of that they used captured Jewish people to do this, but uh, it's certainly not unlikely that they use mercenaries. Maybe so, maybe that's how the first guy got up, is he was the wrong nationality. <laughs> so they sent him up anyway. You know. What is a ramp? A ramp is a, is a, a, long, a long plane Find my thing here again. So if the if the actual ground is like this, this is the ground, and the hill is here, and the wall is here, the city is up here. This is too steep to get this machine up, and so they start building back here this long ramp. All of this is dirt and rock and stuff just piled up to create a less steep approach. Okay, so they're, they're basically making the grade easier. We call it a grade or the, 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 the steepness of the incline uh, to get the siege machine up here. That's what a ramp is. And that's what Ezekiel was building. He was building a little model of a siege machine and this ramp up to the top of his clay brick. So he's got his clay brick here. He's drawn Jerusalem up on the top. He's uh, then get some dirt or whatever he used and he builds this this inclined plane and he builds a little model of a of a battering ram and he's people are walking by wondering okay that's cool what you doing there Ezekiel uh, I'm showing you how God's gonna kill you all uh, <clears throat> so pardon me he is in Babylon yeah Oh, absolutely. Sure, but I think at this early part, they, they weren't being Babylonianized yet. At this early part, they are still hoping to go back soon to Jerusalem. They're of the opinion that the exile was a temporary issue, not a long-range one. And so Ezekiel is trying to convince them this is not temporary and this is not short. You may remember that Jeremiah 
when you studied Jeremiah last week, wrote a letter to the exiles and told them, you need to find a new life in Babylon. You're going to be there a long while. Uh, don't think you're coming home real soon. And so there, there seems to be a mental picture of, 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 the, of the exiles that this is going to be relatively short, and Ezekiel is trying to show them this is not short, this is not a temporary thing, this is, this is a real serious thing. War, of course, constantly a threat in the life of these ancient people, and most ancient wars don't receive comments in the Bible. There's all kinds of wars in the ancient world uh, of which the Bible says nothing. But why is this invasion, this war between Babylon and its invasion of Jerusalem, why is that different? Why is there a, such a, a lot of material, uh, biblically speaking, about this particular conflict? Yeah, because of its theological importance, yeah. Um, God doesn't reckon, apparently, the value of historical circumstances by the same way we do. We, we see historical circumstances and we usually judge them on the basis of size, I suppose. Um, um, uh, but often things that seem to be rather insignificant in the larger world of activities uh, uh, become very important, biblically speaking. And of course that is uh, uh, the case with Jerusalem. Jerusalem was not a, a, a major city of the, of the ancient world. Uh, not like uh, Babylon or Mari or Haran or some of those other big cities. Uh, it was relatively small, but nonetheless it was the city that God had chosen for his temple, and so it becomes significant for that reason. Now, <clears throat> Ezekiel goes into this ordeal um, where he is tied and forced to lay on his side, one side and then lay on the other side for a very, very long time. Um, I wasn't sure when you first started talking, Charlotte, whether you were going to connect it with this thing here, you know, when you were at ASDA. Uh, <laughs> I thought, oh, she's not going to tie herself in there to the toilet or something, is she? Okay. <laughs> um, one of the difficulties uh, of, of understanding this passage is the word that is used, the Hebrew word avon, because the word avon can mean sin or it can also mean punishment. Now in your NRSV, they are going to translate it as punishment, but other English translations are going to translate it as sin. Um, and the, there's a difference between those two and the way that these, these, these ordeals uh, uh, create meaning for the past or the future. If we're talking about lying on your side with respect to sin, then you're looking backwards. People who have sinned. But if you're translating as punishment, you're basically looking forward to the punishment that's going to happen because of the sin in the past. So uh, we're, we're not sure about that. He, he spends all these days on his left side, 390 days. If we put that earlier for the sin of the nation, that would get us back into the reign of Solomon. But if we look at it as punishment forward, that would get us all the way up in the period of the Greeks. Um, so there's, there's not a lot of um, unanimity about, about which way we should go with this. But translators, you, a translator's got to go one way or the other. He can't say both sin and punishment. Because uh, it's just a single word, so he's got to make a decision. And uh, uh, in the case of uh, of the NRSV, they have decided in favor of the the word for punishment as opposed to the word for sin. Then his days on his right side, he's got uh, uh, if if it's earlier, then it's uh, the guilt for the southern nation from the reign of Josiah. If it's later, it puts the period of punishment into the time of the exile. But in either case, neither of these calculations offer us a really easy explanation for what, where their beginning point is or where their terminus is. We can only approximate that. Um, <clears throat> one thing that is clear, however, is that this ordeal that Ezekiel was compelled to, to do uh, would have been extraordinarily painful. I, I, I asked one, uh, uh, one of the doctors in my church, I have several physicians in my congregation in Michigan, what it would mean physiologically to 
be tied up for 390 days, lying on your side. Uh, we have any? Uh, I need to have Mira. She's uh, or Myra. She just is on the verge of graduating with her uh, occupational therapy degree. Uh, who's the, the the young woman that stays with uh, her boys? I should have asked her that last night because I spent some time with her and I just didn't think about it. But are any are any of you physiotherapists or anything like that? Just wondering. I mean, sometimes there are, you know. Um, anyway, the physicians that I talked to said that this would be this would be agonizing, not only from the standpoint of being bored to tears, but from the standpoint of just physiologically, your joints would begin to atrophy, atrophy. Uh, you, you would have extreme discomfort uh, because of the lack of action. Now, some suggest that maybe he only got tied up in the daytime and. You know, he got relief at night. I don't know. But the text doesn't really give us all of those details. But if he tied himself on his left side for 390 days without a break, this would have been absolutely awful. It would have been extraordinarily painful. Um, not to mention he had to cook his food on dung. Um, started out, it was going to be his own dung. And then... God gave him a little break and said, well, you can use animal dung. That'll be fine. Uh, thanks. <laughs> you know? uh, <clears throat> but that wasn't the big issue. The issue was lying on your side. And he does this on, on both sides, the left side and his right side. Uh, so this was a very painful, painful thing. Um, now, <clears throat> in lying on this side, he's symbolizing either the sin or the punishment of the nation because, uh, because of its sins. Um, and he also puts this metal plate between himself and the city, which if you keep reading the passage later, you find out this is a way of saying that God is not going to look with favor on the city. He's, not going to, he's going to be sort of blocked off so that he doesn't see the city with compassion. It's a way of saying that the city is going to go through this ordeal and God is not going to rescue it from this ordeal. Uh, so it's a, it's a, it's a really uh, unusual kind of thing that he does. Now, I know that sometimes in YWAM, you guys do miming and various things like that. Don't you? Uh, do you have you ever done the Ezekiel thing? Tied yourself up in a chair for, how about 390 hours? Okay, well, I just wondered. I, I'm not recommending it. <laughs> It would, be, it would be pretty awful. But, but I think it, it's, it, if you think about it in terms of its, its actual, you know, the actual implications of this kind of thing, more than just a story in the Bible, you have to realize that God called his prophets to do some pretty bizarre things. And often they weren't very comfortable. Um, as I mentioned a day or two ago, if you're going to fill out your application to be a prophet, you need to read some of these passages. Uh, Signing up to be a prophet is not a walk in the park. Uh, it's, it's a difficult, difficult task. And God often calls these people to suffer great anguish because the suffering of the prophet is essentially a mirror of the suffering of God. His people have rejected him. Uh, my people, uh, I've raised them up and they've turned against me. They're like children who have rebelled. And so the suffering of the prophets, and that would be true of Ezekiel, but it would be true of the sufferings of Jeremiah, uh, the sufferings of uh, Daniel, the sufferings of Isaiah, uh, the sufferings of Hosea in the family situation with his wife. Uh, all of this kind of suffering is intended to be a mirror of the pathos of God, the suffering of God in his relationship with his people. Well, I would think that if he actually had a break, it might have said so. I mean, I, I really don't know. I, this is something I'm, I'm kind of leaving open. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, it, that, that looks like you're right near dead when you're <laughs> just surviving is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a quite a large issue here. So I don't know, maybe, maybe he did. Maybe he did it in the daytime where he could be visible to the community. Uh, but even if it was in the daytime, still a pretty, pretty horrendous ordeal. 
uh, any way you slice it. So, yeah. I don't really have an opinion, though, on whether he got a break or not. Uh, that's a speculation. There's nothing in the text that tells us that for sure. By the way, <clears throat> this is Ezekiel bread. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Ezekiel bread. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's based on this passage because Ezekiel gives you the recipe, and uh, Ezekiel bread is, is made out of the recipe that's in the book of Ezekiel. It's made out of spelt and sprouts and stuff like that, you know. My wife loves it. I'm not that crazy about it, actually. <laughs> um, but she buys Ezekiel bread fairly frequently. Do you have it in England? Oh, you don't. Is this an American thing? Okay. Yeah, well, a dumb American, you know. Always trying to do something dumb. <laughs> Pardon me? I don't know. Um, most grocery stores carry it, though, in, in uh, the United States. Uh, um, so we'll have to introduce it. We'll go down to Asda and say, hey, you know, you guys need to order us some Ezekiel bread. <laughs> They'll probably look at you like you have bats crawling out of your ears or something. <laughs> then Ezekiel is called to shave his hair with not a razor but a sword. Um, and the hairs themselves will symbolize different kinds of things. A, a third of them dying inside the city, a third outside the city, a third scattered to the winds, and a few stragglers he stuffs into his, his belt. Um, shaving your hair with a sword had to be really awkward. I, I've never actually shaved with a straight razor. Any of you guys shave with a straight razor? The old-fashioned, you know, just a blade and a strap. I've never actually done it, so I don't know how difficult it is, but it looks to me like it'd be really easy to lose your ear or something. <laughs> um, uh, but to do it with a sword, how awkward would this be, you know? I mean, man, uh, uh, people must have thought Ezekiel was stark staring nuts, you know, uh, doing all these crazy things. But all of these are ways of trying to call attention to what is happening to the city and what's going to happen to the city. So it symbolizes the image of war. Uh, in fact, the imagery of shaving is used several times by the prophets as the, as the imagery of war. You find it in Isaiah, for instance. The Assyrian will shave you bare. That's a way of saying he's going to basically take everything down. Um, so uh, Ezekiel is kind of following in kind with his metaphor. Uh, before the siege is complete, the citizens of Jerusalem are going to eventually resort to cannibalism, which is mentioned here in chapter 5, and we also noticed it in the book of Lamentations. And then there is a mention of the high places in chapter 6, which are under judgment as well, the mountains or the high places, the bamot. The, uh, the word bamot uh, is the word for high place, and it basically means just what it sounds like it means, a, an elevation of some kind. But these were places where the fertility cults of the Baal religion conducted many of their ceremonies in the high places. And so uh, because that is true, the high places are now under judgment because the Israelites have been using the high places and indulging in Canaanite rituals. <clears throat> now, for many, probably most, of the history of the Christian church, we only had a very vague idea about what Canaanite religious worship was actually like. We read about Baal and Asherah in the Old Testament, but we didn't know much about them. But uh, a number of years ago, uh, within the last uh, century, we discovered a huge library at Rashamra, uh, or the ancient city of Ugarit, of roughly 20,000 clay texts. And many of these texts are religious texts that tell us and fill in the details about how the Canaanite pantheon worked, how the mythology worked, how the worship worked. And so we have a much better idea about it today because of these uh, Ugaritic texts than we ever had uh, from the Bible. Because the Bible just kind of assumes when it's, when it's being written and read that the people who are reading it already know this stuff. And in the ancient world, they already did know this stuff. But for a modern person, uh, we didn't know it as well. So this is kind of a sketch of how ancient uh, Canaanite religion works. First of all, Canaanite uh, religion was essentially 
uh, based upon mythology and imitative magic. Mythology was a way of thinking about how the gods behaved, and imitative magic was a way of doing things in the real physical world that would mimic what the gods and goddesses were doing in the unseen world. And that, in turn, would be the substance of Canaanite worship. The idea behind Canaanite worship was to produce fertility. Because everybody needs to have water, they need to have milk, they need to have their sheep uh, and goats you know, multiply, uh, they need to have good farm animals, and so all of this is related to fertility in that sense. The deities are both male and female. There's quite a pantheon of them. In the Canaanite mythology, Baal is uh, the primary god, the god of rain, lightning, and storm. Once you understand that Baal is the god of rain, lightning, and storm, you understand why on top of Mount Carmel, Elijah says the god who answers by fire is really God. He was making a direct challenge to Baal, who is the god of lightning. And when the fire fell, it wasn't when they were praying to Baal, it was when Elijah was praying to Yahweh which is a demonstration that Baal really doesn't control thunder and lightning. It is Yahweh who controls that. And then, of course, after that, Elijah says, you better get ready to go home. It's going to rain. And he sends his servant over to look for a cloud because Baal is the god of rain. And that's another direct challenge. And the, so the whole idea behind Elijah's confrontation there is behind this idea of Baal as the god of lightning and rain and storm. In the spring, Ashtaroth rescues Baal from the power of Mot. Mot is the Hebrew word for death, but it is the, it is the common word for death in all of the other languages of, of, that, of that West Semitic group. So there were a lot of common words, and Mot is one of them. So Mot was considered not only death, but the personage of death, sort of death personified. And Baal is imprisoned by Mot, and when he's imprisoned by Mot, uh, everything dries up. You go through the dry season. It doesn't rain anymore. Uh, everything turns brown. This is when ba uh, Baal is in the underworld, imprisoned by Mot. But then Ashtaroth, who is the goddess of sex and war, she rescues Baal from the power of Mot, and she and Baal mate, and when they mate, then it starts to rain again. And so the crops begin to grow, and uh, fertility once again appears. And so this is an annual cycle. You go through the dry season, and then the rainy seasons, and so on. Uh, and this was all explained in Canaanite mythology by... Uh, the interactions of Baal, Asherah, uh, and uh, Mot. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> we come to the imitative magic part. To imitate the mating of Baal and Ashtaroth, humans participated in sacred prostitution. This was a way of mimicking what the gods and goddesses were supposedly doing in the unseen world. And so the high places are the places where this happens. Once you understand some of this, this, this background mythology, then you understand why the high places and the mountains come in for such censure and rebuke in books like Ezekiel. <clears throat> Both male and female sacred prostitutes serve the public in Canaanite temples and the open-air sacred sites on the mountains. Actually, in Hebrew, there are both male and female words for this cult prostitution. There's the, 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 the Kodeshim and the Kodeshot uh, in the Hebrew Bible, which describe both the male and the female prostitutes uh, associated with Canaanite religion. This is the pantheon. Um, there is Ael, who is the god, supposedly the father god, and then the mother god, who is Asherat. And then they have 70 kids, which are the gods and goddesses of the ancient world, the Elim of the ancient world. Among these... Seventy is Baal and Asherah, uh, but they rise to prominence as the most important of the children of Ael and Asherah. Then, <clears throat> associated with that, there is what are called matzabot. The matzabot are pillars, a little bit like Stonehenge. You know, they're big stone pillars that stand up. They're phallic symbols. Um, if you don't know what that means, uh, ask one of the SBS leaders. Uh, they'll tell you. <clears throat> um, Asherah is a sacred tree. It's a female symbol. Uh, and uh, you find both of those, archaeologically speaking, then there are the Bamot, these high places, uh, where 
uh, this, these rituals were conducted. Here are some examples. This is um, from a tablet in the Louvre in Paris. You can see Baal. He's got lightning bolts in his hand, and he's standing on the back of a bull calf. In fact, Baal, is, uh, as well as most of the gods of the ancient world, were depicted frequently as riding or standing on the back of a bull calf. So you understand why when Jeroboam puts the bull calves uh, at Bethel and Dan, it becomes such a trap for the people of the northern kingdom because it, it be becomes basically a, uh, an association with the wrong side. Uh, this is another bull calf uh, excavated in Israel. This is Baal with his hand raised. Usually uh, often wears this conical looking hat. Uh, we have a number of depictions of Baal from the ancient world. This is uh, probably an Asherah tree. Now, <clears throat> my source, I've never seen this. Most of everything I have up here, I either took the pictures or I've seen it myself. But this one I've never seen. I, this is from a, an, ar an archaeological source I have that says this is in the British Museum. And I have never seen this in the British Museum. Uh, I don't know. Have you ever seen this, Andy? Um, if it's in the British Museum, it must be in the basement somewhere in a closet because uh, I've never seen it in a glass case. And I've sometimes wondered if maybe it was mislabeled in this book, that maybe it's in some other museum. But at least the source I have says it's in the British Museum. In any case, it has a, a sacred tree, which is the female element uh, in the cult. Uh, it also has the symbols of the gods. This is a, a sun disk and the wings of the sun disk. Uh, which uh, depict the god Shamash, uh, which is the sun god. Uh, and then uh, you have, uh, this is at Gezer, uh, not too many miles from Jerusalem, uh, where there is a Bama, a high place, and you can see these large stone uh, pillars that have been erected there. Uh, these are, the, the highest ones of these are around uh, roughly 10 feet tall. Uh, so uh, they're not quite as large as Stonehenge, but they're, they're still big. They're, and we found these at a number of uh, uh, archaeologically excavated sites in ancient Israel. So these high places were used uh, early on. Even some of the Israelites used high places to worship Yahweh. But once the temple was built by Solomon, this was outlawed altogether because there was now a central shrine. There's also a lot of fertility figurines. We have discovered archaeologically more than 3,000 of these little, uh, these little goddess figures, all of them um, in a sort of a sexual pose, uh, which would be typical for Canaanite religion. They certainly testify to uh, the fertility idea of the cult. Uh, these were mostly used in households. These were like little household gods, kind you set on your shelf, you know. Uh, as a, as a, a talisman uh, for your home. Ezekiel says, because of all of this, this pagan idolatry, the end has come. This is the end. The end of Jerusalem, the end of the nation of Judah. The end is the doom of the capital. And as I mentioned earlier, this iron shield shields Ezekiel's face from the model he has built, but it also symbolizes that God himself is going to be shielded uh, from seeing what is happening in Jerusalem. So let me stop for a moment and uh, see if you have questions or observations or, yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it certainly could be. Um, one of the, let me do a little bit of Hebrew here for you. Uh, the term ale is the basic word for God in all of the North West Semitic languages, which includes Hebrew, Moabitish, Edomitish, Ugaritic. Uh, all of these languages use this basic word for ale, and they all use the same alphabet, so it's going to look the same. Okay? In the Hebrew Bible, the term ale can refer to God, just like Elohim can refer to God. Okay, uh, Elohim is a plural form of this. The im ending is the is the sign of the plural in Hebrew. So, 
it depends upon how this one is used. If this one is used uh, with a singular verb, which most of the time it is in the Hebrew Bible, it's just simply translated God. But there are occasions when it is used with a plural verb, and when it is used with a plural verb, it is translated God's small g. For the reader of the Hebrew Bible, they would have to think in terms of context to decide whether or not a word like this referred to a pagan god or referred to Yahweh God. And often what you find in the Hebrew Bible is that the word Elohim or El is coupled with the word Yahweh. So it is not just God, it is Yahweh God. That helps you to, to realize who you're talking about. Okay? Yahweh, on the other hand, is uniquely Hebrew and is not a word for God in any of the other languages except Hebrew. So where Yahweh is used, there's no question. It's just that where El or Elohim is used, that sometimes it could be, uh, could be confusing if they weren't looking carefully at the context. There's also another plural besides Elohim, and this is the word Elim, which is the plural of that as well. This, so far as I know, always refers to pagan gods in the Hebrew Bible. No exception. This, on the other hand, often refers to God because it uses a singular verb. This will always use a plural verb. Okay, so I know that's a lot of language junk, but um, that's sort of the, the gist of the way it works. <clears throat> Yes. So it's not only uh, a male and female God, it's, it's divine incest. Um, actually, this is why some of the, the laws in Deuteronomy and uh, the Levitical Holiness Code are so severe against things like incest. Uh, because incest was actually part of Canaanite religious life. Uh, so the laws that you find in the Torah against those sorts of things are directly in opposition to the culture that surrounded them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. Well, we're not sure that he went to Israel or whether this was in a vision. Most interpreters understand this to be a visionary experience. Not that he traveled back to Jerusalem, but that he saw this in a vision. Uh, he probably wouldn't have had the liberty to travel back to Jerusalem. For one thing, he was a prisoner of war. They don't usually give you passports and funds, you know. So usually we understand this as a, as a visionary kind of thing. Yeah, That's a good question. Well, yeah. Um, the only thing even close to the idea of one God in the ancient world would be a very <clears throat> brief period in Egyptian history under Pharaoh Akhenaten, who uh, tried to turn the Egyptian uh, worship to the sun god only. And I'm not sure that was entirely comparable to Israel, because it wasn't as though he were entirely denying the pantheon of Egyptian gods. He wasn't saying Osiris wasn't a god or something like that saying we should worship uh, Amun-Ra, uh, just one god. Um, uh, and other than, uh, than the period, and this was relatively short-lived, just during the reign of one pharaoh, other than in Akhenaten's period, there's really nothing in the ancient world anywhere that is comparable to Israel's idea that there is only one god. Uh, rather, everybody believed that every nation had their own gods. And often they were very similar to each other, but they still had a pantheon of gods and goddesses and divine children and that sort of thing. And that extends also to the rulers. I should make, make a footnote with that, because in Canaanite and generally in the ancient Near East, the king himself was considered to be a son of the gods. So he was a divine figure. Uh, so 
the king is God. In Israel, God is the king. There's a, a very different way of thinking about it. And the, the ruler on the throne of David, at best, is a representative of God who is the king. God is the real king. He is the king of Israel. So. <clears throat> Um, are you asking when did they when did they use these terms? These are as early as we know. I mean, they go back to the earliest texts we have. Um, what you find in the book of Exodus, however, there's something specifically about the name Yahweh. It says that the patriarchs, speaking of like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God says, did not know me by this name. They knew me by the name El Shaddai but they did not know me by the name Yahweh. So it seems that at the time of Moses, this is the name that now becomes the name God gives based on I am who I am kind of statement, which is actually a verbal form of the name Yahweh. I am who I am is, is directly related spelling-wise to this. Okay. Um, now, if you say that, though, then you have to explain why in the book of Genesis the word Yahweh appears, which it does. Um, does it appear there because they later knew that was who they were talking about and used the word Yahweh, or did they actually know the name Yahweh? Uh, but from the Exodus passage, which is early in the book of Exodus, it would seem to me at least that the patriarchs did not use the name Yahweh. Mm -hmm. Sure, well, he certainly would have known who Yahweh was, and he would have that, that's what I would say, is that he would have used Yahweh in those earlier instances because of his knowledge of it being Yahweh. Right. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Was he what? Uh, you're talking about Moses or you're talking about Ezekiel? Okay, I, we shifted people here, so I want to be sure we're talking about it. Yeah, well, he was, he was said uh, at, at one point he is, he is going to be speechless. Yeah, he will until the actual news of the refugee comes that Jerusalem has fallen. Right. Yeah. He was like uh, John the Baptist's father until the birth of John. He was... Well, God spoke to him, yeah, but he wasn't able to speak to the people, apparently, for that time. Uh-huh. <clears throat> sure. Okay, the word Baal is also the word for Lord in Canaanite languages. And so it has both a proper, what we call, it can be used as a proper name, but it can also be used as something less than a proper name. Okay, so sometimes it means Lord <clears throat> in the sense of master, uh, not necessarily referring to the gods. Uh, but most of the time it does refer to the dog, gods, not dogs, gods. Talk about dyslexic. Um, uh, um, there is a really, a really daring use of the word Baal for Yahweh God in the book of Hosea. Uh, and if you are a Hebrew reader, it just jumps out at you like, whoa, uh, he's not supposed to do that. He's doing it intentionally for a point he's making, and I, don't, I guess I shouldn't get sidetracked into Hosea here, but, uh, but nonetheless, uh, usually the term Baal is referring to a god, but not necessarily all the time. And so when you have place names like Baal, Rimon, uh, Baal, Hazot, various kinds of names, Baal is used as, as usually as a reference to the gods uh, that were believed to inhabit that high place. This is where this god sort of lives, if you will. Now, why David may have used some of those names uh, or others use them, that uh, I don't know that I, I actually know the answer to that. Um, uh, I, I suppose we'd, we would want to look at passage by passage and see. It's not very frequent, but uh, we'd, we'd probably want to look at each of those and see if there's something going on in the passage that would help explain why, why that was used.
Yes. Or Yahweh God with a singular verb. No, I think it's referring to the God. At least this is the way the Hebrews themselves explained it. Because it does do some explaining. On the one hand, you say there's only one God but one, but yet we use a plural word for him. Um, that almost sounds like a contradiction in terms. But generally, it is, it is explained by saying that he, by, on, on the basis of the singular verb, that this is the one God who has many attributes. Um, by the time you get to the early church fathers in the Christian era, the early church fathers are going to explain that in terms of the Trinity. That in the inner being of God, there is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There's one God, but in his inner being, there are some distinguishable elements, if you want to call them elements, I'm not sure what else to call them. Persons is the term they use, but they are distinguishable aspects of God within his inner being. Yahweh is not a plural word. Just Elohim is a plural word. Now, Yahweh is not a plural word. Oh, oh, I see. In, in the, in, in, he's, he is um, what scholars sometimes call a composite one. So the word ahad, which is the word for one, is a word that can be used to refer to not just numerical one like arithmetic, but one in the, the corporate or composite sense. A good example of that would be where the uh, Israelite spies went into Canaan. They brought back these grapes. If you read the Hebrew text, you know, they come back with this pole between them. What it literally says is they brought back one grape. What that means is one cluster of grapes. It wasn't a grape the size of a, you know, a car. It was, it was, it was a cluster of grapes. Uh, but it's, it's a, it, says, it uses the same word, a chad. Uh, and it's, it's a way of helping us understand, at least this passage, understanding this idea of a composite one. Okay, more information than maybe have been required, but uh, interesting nonetheless. Yep. <laughs> what I like is persistence. <laughs> Don't get sidetracked by these grapes. <laughs> well, <clears throat> I suppose we can only speculate about that a bit, but here's my take on it. Ezekiel already has told them the message that God has given him to speak. He has told them that the end has come, Jerusalem is going to fall, you're not going to be in exile a short period of time, you're going to be in exile a long period of time, there's going to be horrific things on the horizon, horrible things, this is going to happen. Once he said that, then when the fall of Jerusalem happens, which they can't know about because they don't have a communication system, but he's going to be silent until the day that a refugee comes and says the city has fallen, when they actually get the communication that the city has fallen. Because at that point, there's nothing left to say. He's already told them everything there is to say. Uh, so I, I think his being silent at that point is, a, is an underlining of the fact that I've already said everything there is to be said. Now you can just wait until we get the news that it's happened. Once it has happened, his mouth is open and he can talk again because now you have verification that he is a true prophet, that what he said actually came to pass. So that's my take on it. Yep. Well, it's similar, although it's uh, the, the father of John the Baptist is not in a context of judgment uh, in the same way, at least, that Jerusalem was. Pardon? Well, I'm talking about the judgment of Jerusalem. Uh, I mean, John the Baptist's father isn't given some message of doom. Uh, so it, it, there's some differences there, although there's obviously some similarities too in that speechlessness. But I don't think they're for the same reason exactly. Um, yep. Oh, no, not at five years. Not that long. Mm 
Okay. Well, I, I, would, I would encourage you to look at the end of chapter 24. Is that where you are? Right. Yes, a lot does happen in between. Okay. I wouldn't say so. I mean, I think that's a legitimate, legitimate approach to reading it. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Well, uh, yeah, that's, 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 that's true. He can. But uh, still, I think his, in, in a sense, if, if it's only that, I mean, that's when prophets, all prophets are supposed to be like that, only speak when God speaks. I mean, I, this seems to be a little more than that. Uh, it would seem to me, anyway. <clears throat> you know, I never actually thought about that, what it would be like to be married to a guy like that, but that's an interesting point of view, yeah. Well, she did die. <laughs> Right. No? Yeah. Oh, he did. She suffered too. You are absolutely right. Absolutely right. Yeah. <laughs> Texted, huh? <laughs> I, but but I think that I think that's a really legitimate point, and that is that uh, there are certain kinds of suffering that is beyond the person himself or herself, uh, and uh, I think that is why Saint Paul says in the New Testament, it would be better for me at least not to be married. Uh, who would be who would want to be married to this guy? Uh, it wouldn't be much better than Ezekiel. Um, but I think that's the I, th I think that's the essence of it is that that the suffering of this individual spills over into the life of other people, and in this case, his wife would certainly suffer greatly out of the circumstance. So I think that's a very very valid point. Yeah. <clears throat> 